When Cossacks in Tikhanka deliver speeches, you won't hear any rustle. Because all people are attentively listening to them. Dear friends, some weeks ago, our true Ukrainian Cossack, Ivo Hester, <laughs> said to us that he did his last speech. But he is so devoted to public speaking and art talkers that he uses his last opportunity to give us one more speech. <laughs> we are very, we are very happy to listen to. Please, welcome to the stage, Ivo Hester. really feeling jubilant to be <laughs> with so many Ukrainians again. Thank you very much, dear Ukrainians and foreigners, to come here today. I'm happy to meet you here, there, everywhere. Because Ukrainians love to travel. <laughs> they think traveling is romantic. I'm not so fond of traveling. <laughs> traveling means packing, unpacking, uncertainty, adventures. <laughs> Dear Ukrainians, tell me, if you go traveling, what do you always pack? What do you always take with you? Suggestions, Sport. please. Passport. Passport. Money. Money. This all. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to roll the right way, except for Vera who takes the enzymes. <laughs> um, very good. Yes, of course. To me, uh, it seems that I always get into very good communication with many countries where they ask me, do you have, and I'm able to give something. That is, um, basis for good communication. <laughs> but traveling romantic in many places, you end up having to wait a long time. So, for those cases, I would advise you, take a good book with you. Stuck somewhere for 40 years or so. <laughs> and read. It will show you the exit. And yes, of course, as already has been mentioned, basically you cannot really go without it. Got <laughs> only. <laughs> Starting to travel. Like I said, you Ukrainians love traveling, so I expect many of you have been to Paris. Anybody? Paris, Oh, romantic. And for Amsterdam? Hands, hands. Easy. <laughs> Batumi? Do you know where I met my first Ukrainian? That was neither. In Lviv, Lodz, Leipzig, London, not even Liverpool, but Liberia, Africa. I do not know how he got there, but I got there as an NGO volunteer working in an irrigation project funded by the Dutch government. I loved assisting the lucky locals by laying pipes, pumping up the agricultural scene, digging canals. Hey, I'm Dutch. I'm supposed to know about canals. <laughs> <laughs> and then came the rains. You might have heard that rain in Africa often comes as an all-covering shower curtain of water splashing across the land for a couple of hours or a couple of days or even longer and in my case the whole irrigation project all the pipes, all the unlucky locals and me got washed out to the sea splash! You might have also heard that my country, the Netherlands is about half, two thirds below sea level so, we have to learn how to swim when we are very small. 
That did not go for my unlucky locals. <laughs> <laughs> so with a lot of effort, in the end, I did get myself washed up on the Liberian shore. And I did not even know that after this flooding disaster, the Dutch government decided to pull the plug of financing any project in Liberia. But, uh, hello, I was still there. Destitute left over on the shores of Liberia. So, what was I to do? How to get out of there? Trying to earn some money somewhere? Well, then I had to go inland to the other Liberians, to the capital, Monrovia. So on foot, I set out to the capital and arrived there, moneyless in Monrovia. Well, there were not much other foreigners around. The only other foreigners were sleepers in white jeeps traveling around somewhere. Huh? Seems they were keeping the peace more in their own barracks <laughs> than in Monrovia. So seldom did I see them. But I, and all the Liberians were looking at me, however small I am, because a white guy on foot in Monroe instead of a Land Rover, that did not really fit their format of foreigner. So nobody wanted to hire me for a job. So sometimes I would sit down at the terrace of Bullet Bar <laughs> and drink a cheap glass of juice. And it was at that time when that jeep came splashing by, splashing up mud, and stopped at the terrace. A bunch of peacekeepers, blue helmets, came out, and one of them, Pakistani or so, passed by, walked inside Bullet Club, and I heard him ask for bottles of juice. And I was looking at the other peacekeepers, and I saw one had painted the bottom half of his blue helmet yellow. <laughs> Ukraina, I said. And yes, he answered, laughing. And that was my first Ukrainian, muscular Muratorians. He came up to me and he asked me, what are you doing in this dangerous dump? <laughs> and he did not get the time to explain that to me, since his Pakistani fellow peacekeeper came with the bottles of juice, they all sat in the white Land Rover and splashing up mud, they drove away. <laughs> I heard Baba laughing at the entrance of Bullet Club. And Baba was the big belly owner of Bullet Club. Still no work, boy! You really want to work, you come to Baba. There's always work. <laughs> well, not much of a choice did I have, did I? <laughs> and outside, it was broad daylight. And inside, it was dark. And with his big belly, Baba pushed me forward inside. And he shouted, Olga! And within ten seconds or so, a long leather blonde lady popped up in front of me. Olga from Kiev! <laughs> Baba! Baby, show the boy! How you work on the pool, I want him this evening on stage to open the program. And Baba disappeared in the darkness of Bullet Club. Olga. No, my name is Praskovia, but that's too difficult for Baba. <laughs> from Kiev? No, from Dnepropetrovsk. <laughs> But that's too difficult for Baba. <laughs> Never in my life have I felt so embarrassed as when I had to watch Olga on the lighted stage practicing her pole dancing. <laughs> no, I was even more embarrassed when after that Olga made me practicing pole dancing <laughs> on her stage. She tried to encourage me. <laughs> you are flexible as rubber. <laughs> Geeky. 
I was glad it was rather dark there, but then again, light on the stage. And the evening fell, and outside it got as dark as inside, only it got there hotter, louder, with music, the smell of sweat everywhere. And whilst the music was getting louder all the time, suddenly I felt I was being pushed on the stage into the light, and the heated atmosphere of the club nearly exploded. Well, I wanted to grab hold of the pole because there were hands getting into the light coming towards me and one even already got hold of my ankle. My goodness, what was I to do? And at that moment, a white guy jumped on the podium, grabbed me by my arms, freed me from the hold on my ankle, got on the floor, kicked some Liberians out of the way and we ran through the bar, tap, 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 tap into the streets, splash, 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 until I was standing next to the white Land Rover. And only then I recognized my muscular Miratorians, Ukrainian. <laughs> we got in the car, sped off, lightly mud splat over the Liberians, but I could not see that, it was dark. And we <laughs> arrived to the peacekeeper's barracks. Well, I was a bit disoriented by then, so I might have been there one day, two days, until a Pakistani peacekeeper said, Guy, get your stuff, there's a United Nations cargo plane flying up north, and you are part of the cargo. <laughs> I don't have any things, I said. So much the better. Travel, light. Get on. saw my first Ukrainian the Mirat audience. But it is clear that however silent or jubilant I am, this Ukrainian, the first one, I have to say that you Ukraine saved me. <laughs>